This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. In this study of Spotlight on the Word, we're going to examine the marvelous book of Psalms. Psalms is part of the 39 books that make up the Old Testament in the Bible. There are 27 other books called the New Testament that tell us about the life of Jesus and how He's going to come back and how we need to be ready to be with Him forever. After all, the Bible is a book from God and it's a book telling us how we can have a relationship with God forever if we will come to Him in loving obedience through Jesus Christ. Jesus has become the author of eternal salvation to all that obey Him. Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9. And what the 39 books of the Old Testament beautifully do is indicate that Jesus is coming. When you look at the book of Psalms, it is part of a five-book section called poetry. Poetry. There is first the book of Job. Job deals with some very profound matters. Job deals with the issue of pain and suffering. Pain and suffering. When you stop and think about that, Job, though part of a classification called poetry in the Old Testament, was a very real character. So says James 5 and verse 11, Ezekiel 14, verse 14 and verse 20, 1 Corinthians 3, 19, as well as Romans 11 and verse 35. So Job was a historical individual. The events that happened to him were true, although they are recorded as poetry. Then we come to the book of Psalms. Psalms also deals with a powerful issue, a great matter in life. It deals with worship and praise. Worship and praise. And even though Psalms follows the book of Job, the two are related in a number of ways because Psalms often touches on the problem of pain and suffering. In Psalm 119 and verse 67, the psalmist declared, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept your word. In Psalm 119 and verse 71, the psalmist again declares, It was good for me to have been afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. So there we have Job dealing with pain and suffering, Psalms dealing with worship and praise, and then we come to Proverbs, the third book in the class called Poetry in the Old Testament. And Proverbs deals with wisdom and understanding, what true wisdom is, what true understanding is all about. And then the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes deals with meaning and the highest good. Ecclesiastes deals with a super achiever who was super disappointed as he looked for purpose and meaning and fulfillment in life apart from God. And then one comes to the book of Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon deals with the matter, a great matter in life, of love and marriage. Love and marriage. So put these together and God chose through poetry to convey some great information about very profound things in life. Pain and suffering, worship and praise, wisdom and understanding, purpose and the highest good, and love and marriage. When you look at the book of Psalms, it is unique in many ways. For one reason, it is the longest book in all of the Bible. It consists of some 150 chapters, so it is a lengthy book. But another reason is this. It was written by a number of authors, human penmen. We typically think of David as the author 
of the book of Psalms. He is the sweet singer of Israel, 2 Samuel 23 and verse 1. He is one through whom the Spirit spoke, 2 Samuel 23 and verse 2. And while it's true that David did compose a number of the Psalms, about half of them roughly, he is not the author of all the book of Psalms. There are a number of authors of the book of Psalms, including Moses. In Psalm chapter 90, that psalm is attributed to Moses. And it seems to me that when you look at the book of Psalms, it's unique because it covers a sweep of time, a wide variety of time, from the time of Moses approximately, and Psalm 90, to the time of the captivity ending in Babylon. Some of the psalms were written after they returned from captivity. So you have the time of Moses, the time of David, going on through the time of the Babylonian captivity. So a tremendous sweep of history is covered in the book of Psalms. But as we think about the book of Psalms, it also, by way of, of information, contains the longest chapter in all of the Bible, Psalm 119. Psalm 119 extols the greatness of God's Word in virtually every verse. 176 verses are found just in that chapter alone. Psalm 119, all telling us about the greatness of God's holy word. If that was the attitude that the people of the Old Testament were to have toward Scripture, what should we have toward the better covenant, the New Testament that tells us about Jesus coming and that He's coming again? Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6. It's interesting to notice that the book of Psalms also contains the shortest chapter in all of the Bible. Psalm 117. Psalm 117 consists of only two verses. And it tells us why everyone should praise God. And really, when you think about those two verses, those two chapters rather, they tell us the heart of the book of Psalms. Everyone should praise God and lift Him up in obedience and love for His holy word. When you look at the book of Psalms, the key word is praises. Praises. And that is what the word psalms literally means. Praises. That's the key word. And again, it deals with worship and praise to God. Well, how are we going to consider 150 chapters in one session? What I'd like to do is show you what a godly person looks like according to the book of Psalms. Seven traits of a truly godly person. And as we consider this, in the first place, by looking at the book of Psalms and then looking at other pertinent passages elsewhere, a truly godly person, according to the book of Psalms, is a person who praises God often. A person who praises God often. If you would just consider some of the key verses in the book of Psalms, in my judgment, that will help you understand this point. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Psalm 8 and verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows His handiwork. Psalm 19 and verse 1. As we look at the book of Psalms, it is a book in which the spectrum of emotion is covered in praising God that He deserves our praise. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Give Him the glory Do His name. Psalm 29 and the verse is 2. Praising God. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endures to all generations. Psalm 100 concludes, God is to be praised. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Psalm 145 and verse 3. Here's something to think about. What we prize, we praise. If we really love some material object, 
If we really love, truly love some individual, we can't help but praise them much and often. This point should be particularly applied to the God who is our Creator, our Sustainer, and our Redeemer, the God who has sent Jesus for us. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul would unpack a truckload, if you will, of doctrinal truth, but he has to do it in the context of praise. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 3. And as he talks about God's plan of salvation in Jesus, all he can do is praise God. Ephesians 1 verse 6, Ephesians 1 verse 12, and Ephesians 1 and verse 14. Indeed, to the praise of His glorious grace... God is worthy of our praise, is He not? It's a wonderful habit of a truly spiritual person, of a truly godly person, that they will praise God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. But secondly, as we think about this idea of habits of truly godly people from the book of Psalms, We need to understand that truly godly people, truly spiritually minded people, Romans 8 and verse 6, are people who are sincere and honest. They're people who are sincere and honest. When you read through the 150 chapters that make up the book of Psalms that comprise this marvelous book, When you look at psalms, it is evident that a number of the psalms are psalms of lament. Lament. And by that I mean the psalmist is lamenting the circumstances, the plight in which he finds himself and is pleading, is crying out to God for help. The creation cries out to the Creator who cares for assistance and compassion. There's a place for this because life is not always lived on the highest, most happy, joyful of planes. There are times one gets discouraged and there are times of lament that come into all of our lives. A good example of this in the book of Psalms is Psalm chapter 42 and 43. Three times in those two psalms that really go together, Psalm 42 and 43, the psalmist declares, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you discouraged? Why do you feel uh, disquieted or distraught or maybe even depressed? Well, I tell you what, in this world, We will have tribulation, Jesus said, John 16 and verse 33. But our tribulation can be turned into joy, he also added, John 16 and verse 20. With but much tribulation we shall enter the kingdom of God, Acts 14, 22. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning, Psalm 30 and verse 5. There are times to weep. There are times to lament. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verses 1 through 11. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12. We all will undergo manifold, varied trials. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 6 through 9. But how we need to remember the manifold, the varied, the multifaceted grace of God. 1 Peter 4 verses 10 and 11. And this grace sees us through. But we need to be honest and sincere with God as it concerns our feelings. As we cry out in desperation, as we need help. After all, we cannot hide things from the God that we serve. He is a God who knows all. Acts 1 verse 24, 1 John 3 and verse 20. He knows all things. Psalm 139 verses 1 through 10. As we keep thinking about this idea, habits of truly godly people from the book of Psalms, we've noted that they are people who are first of all God-praising. 
We've noticed also that secondly, that these are people, truly godly people, they're people who are sincere and honest with their feelings, and they look to God in good times and in bad. But third, when we talk about truly godly people, both in the book of Psalms and in the New Testament, we need to remember this. Truly godly people remember. Truly godly people have a good memory for God and for what He has done in their lives. Psalms deals with this concept often, the importance of remembering. For example, Psalm 78 is sort of a history lesson. There are other Psalms like Psalm 106 that are a history lesson that reminded God's people Israel of how good God had been to them through the years. So when we think about being godly, we also need to consider the importance of remembering that God has blessed us in our lives. Forget not all of His benefits. Psalm 103 and verse 2. That's why we bless the Lord, O my soul, all that within me. Bless His holy name as Psalm 34 says. But do not forget His benefits. In the New Testament, we are instructed to be thankful, Colossians 3.15, to remember. Remember not to forget how God has acted in our lives, the things that God has done. And while this was so true in the book of Psalms as it related to the nation of Israel, how true it should be in our lives now that God has sent His Son, Jesus, on our behalf. So when we think about truly godly people, they remember. They remember and they are stirred up in their minds by way of appropriate remembrance to be holding on to the truth. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Here's a fourth trait of truly godly people. People that we will see in the book of Psalms and throughout the entire Bible for that matter. But this is brought out in the book of Psalms so powerfully. Truly godly people love God's Word and properly obey it. True godly people, people that truly would serve Him, they love His Word and they properly obey its teachings. Especially in Psalm chapter 1 and in Psalm 119 do we see this magnificent truth taught. At the very beginning of the book, a contrast is drawn between the godly and the ungodly. And the godly man is known for the fact that in God's law, he meditates day and night. He delights himself in the law of the Lord. He doesn't sit and stand and walk with those who are going the wrong direction. It's a matter of priorities and he will be stable because he has his mind, her mind, focused on the things of God and will take great root in him because God is the source of real joy. In his presence is fullness of joy. Psalm 1611, God is our exceeding joy. Psalm 43 and verse 4, and so when you look at a psalm like the very first psalm, understand, my friends, that truly godly people love the Word of God and properly seek to obey its teaching. In Psalm 119, the longest chapter of the Bible, again it extols the greatness, the majesty of God's Word. You see, God's Word, Scripture, carries with it all of the force that the very voice of God itself would if God were speaking to us at this very moment in time. In Psalm 119, the Bible talks about your Word. That's the best possession. Your Word have I hid in my heart. That is the best place. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's the best purpose, the best possession, 
the best place, the best purpose, God's Word in the heart that we might not sin against Him. As you keep looking at Psalm 119, Oh, how I love your law. Psalm 119, verses 97 and 98. My heart stands in awe of your word. Psalm 119, verse 161. And consider yet again, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my pathway. Psalm 119, verse 105. As we consider the book of Psalms, it encourages people who truly would be godly to love God's Word, and to properly apply God's commandments to their lives. To be doers of the Word and not hearers only. James 1 and verse 22, to be sanctified in the truth because God's Word is truth. John 17 and verse 17, to let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly in all wisdom. Colossians 3, 16, the book of Psalms, just like the other 65 books of Scripture, admonishes us to love God's Word and to properly apply its teaching to obey God's truth. Buy the truth and sell it not. Proverbs 23 and verse 23. But as we continue looking at these seven traits of truly godly people, here is a fifth trait to consider. And the fifth trait has to do with repentance. Truly godly people will be broken hearted over sin and repent. When you look at the book of Psalms, passages like Psalm chapter 32 and Psalm chapter 51 come to mind. The psalmist comes to God in repentance desiring that God create in him a clean heart, Psalm 51 verses 9 and 10. Because of sin in David's life, in this case with Bathsheba, we read about that in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12, his adultery with her, David being guilty of murder and having Uriah slain, the husband of Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God. Create in me a clean heart. Wash me. David understood that because of sin, he required the most radical of surgery. His heart was broken and in sin and couldn't be repaired. It needed to have a new creation. Create in me a clean heart, O God. That helps us understand a great deal about the necessity of repentance and how that godly sorrow leads to repentance. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10. That unless one repents, one will perish. Luke 13, 3 through 5. In Acts 17 and verse 30, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He commands all men everywhere to repent, inasmuch as He has appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness through the one that He has ordained. Speaking of Jesus, truly godly people are brokenhearted over sin. We don't allow ourselves to become calloused and cold and indifferent towards sin, because sin separates men from God, Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. Because sin will cause people to be lost. Men have fallen short of the glory of God due to sin, Romans 3 and verse 23. It is only through Christ that our sins can be dealt with as we Resolve in repentance. There's a change of mind because of a change of heart that leads to a change of direction or life. When we repent of sin, we hate it. We hate what's gone on in our lives due to that sin. And we look to the Lord through Jesus to remove sin by the blood of the cross. 1 John 1 verses 7 through 9. But here's a sixth trait of truly godly people that can be seen in the book of Psalms. Truly godly people are thankful. They are thankful. Perhaps there's no better illustration of this in the book of Psalms than Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, 
all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is He that has made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endures to all generations. Oh, how important it is to be thankful for God and for all of His blessings. Neither were they thankful. Romans 1.21 was said about a group of people that just got caught up in such sin that eventually God gave them up. As we think about this idea of gratitude, think of Philippians 4 verses 6 and 7. In nothing be anxious. In nothing Worry, there's the prohibition. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding shall guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. Again, that's Philippians 4 verses 6 and 7. When we think about how wonderful God has been to us through the years, when we think about how He has blessed us so richly in Jesus, there is salvation in Him, 2 Timothy 2.10. When we think about how there's no condemnation in Christ now, Romans 8 and verse 1. When we think about every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is to be found in Christ, Ephesians 1 verse 3. We should sing hallelujah, praise to God. Oh, there should be great gratitude for the one who loves us so much and blesses us so richly in Jesus. But finally, as we think about some habits of truly godly people that are evidenced in the book of Psalms, the word trust comes to mind. Truly godly people trust God no matter what. When you think about this, the 23rd Psalm is a marvelous example. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. Yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Trusting God without faith, it is impossible to be well-pleasing to Him. For he that would come to God must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of them who diligently seek after Him. Hebrews 11 verse 6. As we conclude the study of the book of Psalms on Spotlight on the Word, is that the kind of faith that you have in God? Let's have a true and real and godly faith.